uh, everyone, and welcome back to Human Biology here at Chaminade University. Today is going to be an introduction to biology, anatomy, and physiology, all of which we're going to kind of have a crash course in throughout the semester. So let's go ahead and get started. Just some basic definitions. So biology is defined as the study of all li living things. That includes their structure, their function, their interrelationships with other organisms, and their growth and repair. We're also going to talk about anatomy and physiology, and these are very similar, but they're different in a little way. So anatomy talks about the actual physical structures within an organism, and physiology talks about how those physiological structures, sorry, how those physical structures function on a physiological level. So when we talk about living things, every single living thing is a little bit different from the other living things that in its species, right? So we have genetic variation among populations in order to ensure that no matter what kind of disastrous event life throws at them, some of them will be able to survive whatever environmental change occurs. There are currently approximately eight and a half million species known to be living on Earth, and they are all subdivided into six kingdoms. These kingdoms are going to include archaebacteria, eubacteria, protista, fungi, plants, and animals. And for the purposes of this semester, we will be focusing mainly on animals, specifically on one animal, that is the Homo sapien. All right, so the way that we organize these organisms into categories or kingdoms are based on multiple characteristics. The first is whether or not they are a single-celled organism or a multicellular organism such as yourself. Now, most single-celled organisms are prokaryotic. That means that they're very simple. They are not going to be organized in such a complex way as, say, eukaryotic cells, such as ours. We also want to talk about the environment in which they live, the kind of movement that they are able to produce, and how they acquire their energy. Namely, do they acquire their energy from the sunshine, like plants, or do they acquire their energy from other resources, like the way animals eat other living beings and absorb those energy molecules? Okay, so this is an overview of the different six kingdoms. All of the organisms on planet Earth can be categorized into one of the six kingdoms. And again, we are going to focus very specifically on animals and very specifically on one particular animal, that is humankind. But let's talk about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. So prokaryotic organisms are usually, or pretty always, they are always single-celled organisms. They are very simple in their cellular structures, and they don't have different regions of the cell that are compartmentalized for particular functions. These regions are known as organelles. We have organelles within our human cells that are going to make sure that we have different roles within the cell, similar to the way the rooms in your house might play different roles in the functions of your house, right? One room would be where you would cook, one would be where you would sleep, one would be where you would bathe, right? In a prokaryotic organism, it's basically like having one large, just a hut, and you would have everything in the same location, right? You would both bathe and sleep and eat in the same area. So again, there's no membrane-bound organelles in a prokaryotic organism, meaning there's no nucleus, mitochondria, or what we know as an endoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about that when we talk about cells. Um, we, they do have DNA, though. All of these cells are going to have DNA as their reproductive material, and DNA in this case is going to be located in the cytoplasm because we don't have a nucleus to be able to hold our DNA, whereas eukaryotic organisms are going to have the DNA bound inside the nucleus, and we're also going to have membrane-bound organelles that are going to function to be able to have specific roles within the cell so we can compartmentalize the different functions within the cell into these different membrane-bound organelles. Okay? Um, archaebacteria is going to be one of the oldest, most primitive living creatures on Earth. Here's the archaebacteria here. These are all prokaryotes. That means that they're single cells. And they can live in very extreme environments, such as really freezing temperatures, really high temperatures, really salty temperatures, acidic temperatures. Um, so these are specific types of creatures that are able to um, work with basically whatever they're given. This is an example of a species that's called a methanogen, which basically takes methane gas and I'm sorry, produces methane gas in conditions where they don't have um, oxygen present. All right, here we go. Here's a eukaryotic or eubacteria. Sorry, these guys are still single-celled. These are not eukaryotic. Sorry, these are eubacteria. They're still prokaryotic. They're found everywhere on the planet. Most of them are basically either harmless or helpful. So most of them are going to go completely undetected or be useful. For example, in your gut, there's um, bacteria that are going to be helpful. They're probiotics, right? They're going to be helpful in breaking down different organisms in your gut. But we do have 
bad guys, if you will, that cause human diseases. Some good examples of that are going to include things like syphilis or tetanus or pneumonia or tuberculosis. These are going to be bacterial infections that can cause some very sickly states in humankind. All right, the next category we're going to talk about are protists. Protists are also single-celled, but these guys are eukaryotic, so they're a little bit more complex than our prekaryotic precursors. We have several different species that are going to have multiple different characteristics. They can have spores, uh, chloroplasts, or the ability to move, similar to fungus, plants, and animals. So these are going to be basically precursors to the next step up. These guys, because they are eukaryotic, eukaryotes are going to have specific um, membrane-bound organelles within, so they're going to have uh, nuclei. They're going to have different spaces that are compartmentalized for, for example, I have an endoplasmic reticulum that's going to be compartmentalized for the creation of proteins. And they can also sometimes have specialty structures, such as flagella or cilia, that allow them to have locomotion. For example, this paramecium is going to be covered in cilia here on the outside. Fungi are the next category we're going to discuss. These guys are multicellular, typically. The exception of that is going to be yeast, which we use to brew beers and breads. Um, these guys are also eukaryotic. Anytime we get to multicellular cells, we, or multicellular organisms, we know they're eukaryotes. And eukaryotes, again, are going to have multiple membrane-bound organelles. They're going to have a nucleus, etc. Now, fungi are not photosynthetic. That means they cannot create their own food from sunlight, but they typically are going to be detrivores. That means that they're going to be decaying other organisms to help create their food. So they'll take organisms that they are found, they're decomposers essentially, they take other organisms that they find nearby and break them down to be able to get what they need to be able to create themselves. This here is a shaggy mane mushroom. It's found in North America and it is edible, but the point that they're trying to make in this image is that it can be easily confused with a fungus called a magpie fungus, which is poisonous and lethal. So some of them can be either beneficial or they can give you good energy or they can also be poisonous as well. And if anyone who's ever watched Babar the Elephant knows, some mushrooms can be difficult to differentiate between the poisonous kinds and the non-poisonous kinds. Some examples of fungi are going to include mushrooms, mold, mildew, etc. All right, let's move on to plants. Plants are also multicellular eukaryotic organisms, but they have a really specialty organelle called a chloroplast, which is a green little organelle inside there that are photosynthetic. So these stacks of chloroplasts, or well, inside the stack, inside the chloroplasts, there's little stacks of layers that are going to capture the sunlight and use that to drive the creation of glucose. It uses that glucose to create its own matter. That's how plants actually grow. They don't use any of the, they don't create mass from the dirt, for example. They actually create the mass from thin air, from taking carbon dioxide and turning it into, so carbon dioxide has C and oxygen, carbon and oxygen, and converting it into glucose, which is C6H12O6. It does that by the addition of water, so that's where our hydrogen comes from. And that's going to give us all of this biomass, and that's a process of photosynthesis. We, as humans and other organisms that are um, going to eat, either plants or other animals, are going to have the opposite of this. That's called cellular respiration, where we take down a glucose molecule and we break it down into carbon dioxide um, and water. And this is the process of cellular respiration. This is how we get almost all of our energy, right? Now, plants are very special because, again, they make their own energy from the sunlight. And they're also able to live in a lot of different environments. They can live in land or they can live in aqueous environments, i.e. in the water. All right, so animals are a super diverse group of multicellular. Again, multicellular means eukaryotic. So multicellular eukaryotic organisms that are non-photosynthetic. What does that mean? That means that they're not able to create their own energy from the sunlight, but we do get our energy from extra, extra, uh, extrogenous sources. We're going to get it from other plants or other animals that we may eat. So an organism that eats other eats plants is going to be called an herbivore. It's going to use that to be able to get their energy. An organism that eats um, animals is going to be called a carnivore. And we as humans are right in the middle. We're something called an omnivore in that we can derive energy from plants and animals. Um, but we are also, again, non-photosynthetic. Other traditional traits of animals is that they're able to live both in land or in, on land or in water. And they have the ability to move around. So they have locomotive capability. This is something that plants do not have, right? Okay. So now that we've done kind of an overview of the biological classifications of organisms, let's talk about the human body. So the human body is basically going to be comprised on the very smallest level of atoms. Atoms are going to be put together into what we call molecules, so multiple different atoms in a certain arrangement gives us a particular form. Form is going to define function. You're going to hear that a thousand times throughout this class. 
So these molecules can be arranged um, in, in ways where we have many different molecules coming together to create what we call cell structures. In this case, is the phospholipid, just one, and that's going to create a phospholipid bilayer, which is a cell structure. Cell structures come together to make cells. Cells come together to make tissues. Tissues come together to make organs. Organs come together to make organ systems, like the digestive system is comprised of the esophagus, the stomach, um, the small intestines, the large intestines, and the rectum, right? All of those organs come together to create this organ system, and multiple different organ systems come together to create the organism. So at each of these levels, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So this molecule is worth more than just the atoms that comprise it, and this cell structure is worth more um, than just the molecules that comprise it, and the cells are worth more than the cell structures that comprise it, tissues worth more than the cells that comprise them, etc. So as we get up in these levels of orders of complexity, we are actually going to become more and more um, reliant on each other and interdependent. So every organ system has multiple different organs that it relies on to function. The organism has multiple organ systems it relies on to function, etc. So every level that we go up in complexity, we also go in in dependence, right? Okay, so this is an overview of the different organ systems that we are going to be talking about throughout this semester. So you're just basically going to be getting a crash course in each of these organ systems. The first one we're going to talk about is the integumentary system here. This is skin. Um, and while they're introduced in this order here, we're going to have to rearrange them a little bit in our modules, so it might not be exactly introduced in this order throughout the course. Um, the integumentary system is going to be comprised of skin, hair and nails. This is the first protective barrier that we're going to see before microorganisms are able to enter into the body. Another organ system that we're going to talk about throughout this semester is the skeletal system. The skeletal system is comprised of bones. You will need to know most of the major bones and their organization within the body by the time we're done this semester. Um, we're also going to have joints, which is where two different bones are going to come together, or what we call articulate. So this is going to be an, a site of articulation of multiple bones. And usually we're going to have some cartilage inside of these joints as well. And this cartilage is here pointing to the connection between the ribs um, and the sternum. So again, the skeletal system is going to be something that's going to attach to muscles as well as from bones to bones. All right, and we're going to see ligaments and tendons and how they work as well when we get to that. All right, this is the skeletal muscle. Um, we have multiple different sets of muscular systems. We have skeletal muscle, we have cardiac muscle, which is specific to the cardiac system, so specific to the heart. And then we also are going to have smooth muscle, which we find in places like the urinary bladder and in the intestines and in the reproductive organs in the female. Um, we're also going to talk about the nervous system. The nervous system works hand in hand with the muscular system to do what? Well, with the skeletal muscle system, it works to move the bones, right? So when the muscles contract, it moves the bones, and the bones move the body, and that's how our limbs and appendages, and etc., are going to remain rigid when we are awake and um, be able to move around under our voluntary control. So again, the nervous system is going to innervate the muscles, and the muscles are going to work together to move the bones, and that is how we get motion. All right, we will not be talking about the endocrine system in this semester, but just a quick overview. The endocrine system is going to create and secrete hormones from multiple different regions, including in the brain, the pituitary, and the hypothalamus, and the pineal. Um, in the throat, we've got the thyroid and the parathyroid glands, which are right next to the... Um, right next to the thyroid. Then we have the adrenals, which lie just superior, that means above, uh, superior to the kidneys. We're also going to have the gonads, namely the ovaries and the testes, which are going to be secreting hormones as well. All of that are going to have roles in multiple different organ systems. So these are going to obviously have roles in reproduction as well as in male differentiation if we're talking about um, testes secreting testosterone. Um, the adrenal glands are going to play a role in the fight or flight and in regulation of multiple different things, including um, a homeostasis of uh, fluid balance. Um, thyroid and parathyroid are going to be involved in calcium levels. Pituitary is going to be involved in all sorts of things, but also uh, things like fluid balance, etc. So each of these different glands will secrete different hormones, which are involved in maintaining what we call homeostasis, or keeping within the parameters of whatever our select system is. Okay. The cardiovascular system serves to pump blood throughout the body. So the blood is first going to get pumped out of the heart to the lungs where it gets oxygenated. Then it goes back into the heart where it gets pumped back out of the heart again through the aorta and goes out into what we call systemic circulation to service the rest of the body, making sure that every cell in your body is close enough to the blood supply so that it can get bathed in nutrients and have its waste taken back out. Right, then that blood supply is going to be returned. Here you can see it in blue through the superior and inferior vena cava, dumping back into the heart for recirculation. 
All right, so that's an overview of the cardiovascular system. Don't worry, you're going to get an entire lecture on that in the coming weeks. The respiratory system works hand in hand with the cardiovascular system, as I mentioned. Here's the cardiac notch here. Blood's going to go out of the um, heart and go out into the pulmonary system, which is the re respiratory system, to be able to get oxygenated. Then it'll get pumped back into the blood, where it'll go out for systemic circulation. Basically, the respiratory system allows gas exchange. So we're going to have gas coming in from the nasal and oral cavities, down through the larynx, through the trachea, into the lungs. At the very end of the lungs, we're going to have bronchi, so then into bronchioles. Eventually, we'll get to these alveoli, which are going to be the site of gas exchange, where we're actually going to be off-gassing carbon dioxide and bringing in oxygen. All right? Um, and again, don't worry, we will get an entire chapter talking about the respiratory system. All right, the purpose of the digestive system is to take food in and break it down for metabolic use. So we take in food through our oral cavity, then we're going to start the process of digestion through the secretion of salivary glands, which is going to allow us to do the very first set of chemical digestion. We have chemical digestion and physical digestion occurring in the mouth through the process of what we call chewing or mastication. When that happens, again, we're going to have physical digestion as well as chemical digestion from the salivary glands releasing amylase. Then we're going to swallow that food. It's going to go down the esophagus into the stomach. Then it's going to have the addition of gastric um, enzymes as well as gastric juices to help break that food down even further. Then it's going to become what we call chyme. At that point it's going to exit out through the stomach into the small intestines where it's going to be the process of digestion is going to um, continue. However, we're going to have a large pH change. Here we have a pH of 4. We're going to have a pH of 7 in the intestines. We're going to be switching enzymes um, for things like proteases, etc. We'll get new ones in the small intestines that work with the new pH. From the small intestines, we're going to go on to the large intestines. The purpose of the large intestines is mainly fluid resorption, but we also have some bacteria in there that are going to help make things like vitamin K, etc. Um, and then once we've taken all of the nutrients that we can out in the small intestines and in the large intestines we've also taken out much of the water in the large intestines now we're going to have um, fecal matter what's left is going to empty out into the rectum to be defecated out through the anus so that's going to be the overview of digestion and again don't worry you'll get an entire chapter on that one as well the urinary system or the process of micturition which is the creation and excretion of urine is going to start in the kidneys the kidneys have specialty organs called glomeruli, which are going to be surrounded by a Bowman's capsule. And then we're going to have fluid pressure where the blood is going to be forced into the, Bowman, um, into the glomerulus. The blood cells remain, but the blood fluid, the plasma, gets pushed out into the Bowman's capsule. Then as we head through the nephron, we're going to have a series of exchange of solutes back and forth where the fluid is going to turn into urine. Eventually, it's going to be released after it goes through the renal pyramids and then out into the minor calyx, out through the major calyx, out through the... Um, uh, uh, out through the ureter. Sorry, the ureter is going to lead into the urinary bladder, which is going to be a smooth muscle organ that's going to be allowing, it's going to have distension, which allows for you to have fluid build up. And eventually, when we have the urge to urinate, we're going to have fluid leave out through the urethra, which is how urine is going to exit the body. All right, the reproductive systems we're going to talk about at the end of these uh, semester. We're going to have the female and the male reproductive system, which serve to create gametes. What are gametes? Egg and sperm, which are going to have half of the genetic material of a full-grown organism. They're going to be haploid. When sperm, again, haploid is deposited into the vagina and then makes it all the way up into the fallopian tubes, it can meet um, an egg. And if that occurs, the process of fertilization can occur as it travels down the fallopian tubes until it embeds and implants inside the endometrial layer of the uterus. This implantation is going to signal what we call the pregnancy. So this is when we're going to actually have a pregnant female after the implantation event. Um, and then for the next 9 to 10 months or so, this fetus will um, grow inside this womb and get larger and larger inside the uterus. Okay, we'll talk about all the specifics of the male and female reproductive systems again towards the end of this um, semester. We'll also discuss the immune systems and the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system works to create immunity. Uh, it works in two ways. We're going to have T cells and B cells. T cells are going to come from the thymus, B cells from the bone marrow that are going to digest any sort of foreign bodies. So they're going to digest things like microbes that might come into the system, etc. And they're able to do two things. They're able to be free floating in circulation as well as be isolated in regions that are these lymph node regions. You have these little dots 
right? We have lymph nodes in our neck and our inguinal canal all the way up through our, um, our trunk. And these basically serve as regions where the T cells and B cells stay seated and fluid flows across them. It allows them to be able to basically clean or filter this lymphatic fluid, kind of like a Genki Sushi where they just stay seated at the tables and all the food just goes right on past them and they eat whatever they can. This is going to clean up our lymphatic fluid, which is going to serve as a drainage system basically for anything that's extra after the cardiovascular system has leaked fluid out but isn't picked up properly by the capillary bed. We'll then go back into the lymphatic system. Again, it gets cleaned and filtered and then is going to get sent back into circulation by being emptied into the subclavian duct. Okay, now let's take a moment to discuss some anatomical terms. I'm going to start here on the left. So when we're talking about the facial region, we can talk about multiple different sections. So we can talk about the frontal section, which refers to the forehead, the cephalic region, which basically refers to the entire head, the cranial region, which is going to refer to the entire skull section, temporal refers to the temple, Orbital refers to the eye, so you can also hear it as ocular. Nasal refers to the nose, oral mouth. Mental will be the chin. Cervical is going to be this, the neck. We have the cervical region, the thoracic region, and then the lumbar region. Those are going to be the three major regions of the spine, cervical, thoracic, and then lumbar. Um, if we're looking at the shoulder section, that's the acromion, and when we talk about bones, you'll see why. Um, the armpit region is called the axillary region, so when we're talking about the axillary arteries or axillary veins, right, that's going to be talking about the armpit. Basically, where we're changing over from the thoracic region, the pectoral region, over to the brachial region, which is going to refer to the arm. In front of the elbow, that's the antecubital. That's going to be that little region when you're bending um, your elbow that's going to bend, basically your hinge. Uh, the antebrachial is going to be the forearm. Following that down, we're going to hit the carpals, and we have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, for example. That's going to be the wrist region. So we have the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So the carpals will be the wrist, palmar will be your hand, and phalangeal will be your digits or your fingers. Okay? Your hand is going to be your manual. And if we're looking at specific um, digits, we're looking at the thumb, for example, that's called the pollux. If we're looking at the great toe, that's called the hallux. The rest of them are all called phalanges. So phalangeal will be your digitals for your toes or for your hands. Um, let's see, what else am I missing? So let's look at the thoracic cavity here. This is the mammary section in a female. It would be pectoral in a male. Umbilical is going to be the navel region, also known as the center of the abdomen. As we're moving down, this is going to be the pelvis region, which makes sense. That's where your pelvis is. Then this is the inguinal region, okay? I'm um, going to be where our iliac artery is split off. Um, as we head down, we're going to, here's the pubic region. Head down, we'll hit the, the legs. This is the femoral region of the thigh section. Patellar would refer to the knee. Curval would refer to the leg. You can also hear it referred to as the lower limb or specifically the fibular region or the tibular region. Fibular, so this is the fibula, which goes on the outside. It does not connect directly to the knee. The tibia is going to be the weight-bearing bone that connects from the knee all the way down to the ankle, which is known as the tarsal region. Tarsal connects to the pedal region. That's the foot region, which then leads into, again, the metatarsals and then the phalanges. Okay? From the back, some things that I missed, although I guess we did talk about cephalic, occipital, and cervical region. The scapular region is going to be your shoulder blade. This is the back of the shoulder. The spinal column is the vertebral column. Again, it is split up into the cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar. The very lower part of the lumbar region is called the sacral region. Then we're going to get into the rear. That's the glutes or the gluteal region. Um, the perineal region is going to be the region between the external genitalia and the anus. Heading down, we'll head to the popliteal region, which is basically going to be the back of the knee. It's the equivalent of the antecubital in the elbow. Um, and then the sural region is going to be the lower limb and the calf. Heading down to that, we'll get to the calcineal region. Calcineus is going to be the actual heel bone. We'll talk about that when we get to bones, but that refers to calcineal. It's going to be where we have our Achilles tendon, right? Um, then we have the plantar region of the bottom of the foot or the sole of the foot. All right, some other anatomical terms that we're going to talk about throughout the semester are going to be directional terms. So please make sure that you orient yourself um, with these pretty well. Superior means up or above or closer to the head. Inferior means down, below, under, or further away from the head. The front of your body or your belly region, for example, would be the anterior region. The back of your body, like the sacral region, will be your posterior region, okay, towards the back of the body. Um, and then for us in humans, this will be the same. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. For us in humans, it's going to be similar for other organisms for anterior and posterior, but they also will have ventral and dorsal, which sometimes will be different depending on if you, if you are, for example, a cat or a dolphin or, for example, a human, depending on how you orient yourself. So dorsal and ventral will be different if you go into, for example, veterinary biology as opposed to human medicine. 
Um, proximal and distal are going to refer to where the where the organ or system is relative to an attachment point. So if it is closer to the trunk, then it's going to be proximal. If it's further away, it's going to be distal. So for example, the wrist is distal to the elbow and the elbow is proximal to the wrist. All right, we also talk about medial or lateral. Medial will be getting closer to the center of the midline, as in closer to the spinal column. Lateral will be further away from the midline, closer to, say, the shoulders and hips or outward. Um, we also are going to have an intermediate section, which will be found in between whatever those two structures we are, or we're referring to are. Um, and then we also are going to, if we're looking um, at for example, the femoral artery. We have a superficial and a deep femoral artery. So we have two, one that's going to run closer to the surface of the body and one that's going to run towards the inner thigh, right? The deep is going to run all the way towards the interior of the body, closer to the bone, whereas the superficial is going to run closer to the skin. All right? So this here will help you with your directional terms. Again, superior is going to be towards the head, inferior towards the feet. If we're going back towards the trunk, it's proximal. Further away from the trunk is distal. Again, the elbow is going to be proximal to the wrist and the wrist is the wrist is distal to the elbow right um, this here is the midline if we're headed towards the midline it's medial so this is medial this would be lateral right if we're headed outward it's going to be lateral so this is the medial side the side that's inside closer to the midline of say the limbs or the lateral is going to be the outside so if we're talking about the medial knee that'll be here lateral knee will be outside so we're talking about the meniscus we have the lateral and the medial meniscus for example which again is found inside the knee okay so familiarize yourself with those anatomical terms as well as some of these body planes so we're going to be looking at sections of the human body as though we have divided it in half Many different times we're going to look at different sections. So um, a mid-sagittal section is what you're kind of expecting to see. This is when we're dividing the body into equal left and right sections. This here is a mid-sagittal dissection. So if we took a scalpel and we cut right down, boop, 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 if that man was facing forward and we cut right down, that would be considered a mid-sagittal section. Now a parasagittal section is going to divide the body into right and left portions, but not equally. So this here would be a parasagittal section. If we were to take a section right here, still dividing it left and right, but we've got more on the right than on the left, for example. Now a frontal section is going to be dividing the body into anterior and posterior parts. So we're basically slicing this way, cutting off, for example, the face. Um, and we can also have a transverse section where we're dividing the body into what we call superior and inferior parts, or the upper and the lower level. And that's going to look like this, cutting off your legs, for example. All right. So a transverse section or a cross section is what we might do if we were looking through the body cavity here at the midline. All right. Um, Let's see. So here are the plane, body planes that we were just talking about. Uh, Mid-sagittal plane is going to run right on through the midline here. A transverse plane is going to run um, like cutting off your legs. Um, here's a frontal plane cutting off your nose. This here is the frontal plane, this whole thing. The parasagittal plane is going to go through the body and cut it into left and right sections, but it's not going to be exactly equal on the left or the right. Um, and then we also have an oblique, oblique plane, which is basically cutting through at any angle that is not going to be the traditional ones, and we would actually classify this as an oblique plane, 50 degrees, oblique plane, 72 degrees, or whatever. Basically, any plane that's not going to be 90 degree angles of each other is considered an oblique plane, and you would not only say that it was an oblique plane at that region, but then you would indicate um, the exact angle of the cut that you were making. Okay, um, so here's a little bit more of how we could describe things. So if we were going to be taking that frontal plane, again, that frontal plane is going to be cutting right on through. Um, this is the front of the head. You would have an, one eye here and one eye there. So we'd have a frontal plane, again, cutting off the face. If we are looking at the, um, the transverse plane, it's going to go through the body like this. Again, here's one that would be done, say, at the belly. This is instead going through the brain. Um, we also have the mid-sagittal. Again, the mid-sagittal is going to go straight down the middle. Parasagittal would be over in the, like, for example, one quarter of the way instead of halfway, right? And then we also have this dorsal versus ventral, which is, again, going to be, um, in this case, directly oriented with our superior and inferior, okay? Um, all right, so these are major body cavities. Body cavities are going to be regions where we're going to 
have or house inner organs separately from other organs. So we have the cranial cavity, and it's really easy to guess what's housed here. That's right, it's the brain and the cerebral spinal fluid, which runs all the way down the vertebral column. We also have the thoracic cavity. This is going to be our area of our heart and our lungs. Then we have an abdominal cavity where we're going to find most of our digestive and reproductive organs, um, such as our stomach, our small and large intestines, um, and for the ladies, the uterus, um, for everyone, the urinary bladder. Gentlemen, your reproductive organs are going to dangle a little bit on the outside here, so they might not found exactly in that um, abdominal cavity, but we also are going to have the pelvic cavity down here. Again, that's going to be where we find the reproductive organs for the female as well as the bladder. Um, okay. So this here is talking about the major cavities. Again, we have the cranial cavity, the vertebral cavity, which is where we're going to have our cerebral spinal column, the thoracic cavity, where we're going to house our heart and our lungs, and the abdominal pelvic cavity, where we're going to um, house our um, digestive and reproductive organs. So this thoracic cavity here is going to include um, the heart and the lungs, and each of these are going to be surrounded by membranes. So um, we have the pericardial membrane, which surrounds the heart, and the pleural membrane, which surrounds the lungs. And each of these are going to be housed within the pericardial and the pleural cavity. So there is a particular cavity for the heart as well as a particular cavity for the lungs found within the thoracic cavity. So every organ is in its own particular location within the body. They're not just tossed in there willy-nilly, obviously. Okay, and if we're looking at the stomach or the abdominal pelvic cavity, we can split it into nine major regions. Basically, the top, the middle, and the bottom, or superior, middle, and inferior, as well as the left, and again, this is left on the organism or on the individual, not on our left, the middle, and the right. And if you were to go in, for example, complaining of pain in a particular region, then we might have a particular diagnostic capability that we would make. Of course, we would obviously want to back that up with imaging and tests, but the first thing that the doctor would do would say, okay, where does it hurt? And then what does it feel like, right? Is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Is it um, kind of like a dull ache, et cetera? And then they might be able to use that to diagnose what kind of, um, to, to kind of narrow down which tests they're going to be running to be able to get you an accurate diagnosis. Okay, um, but we can also take it and diagnose it into four major quadrants, if you will. So four major abdominal pelvic quadrants, again being the left upper, right upper, left lower, and right lower. Okay, so now let's move on to macromolecules. Macromolecules are going to be when we take our atoms and we put them together into larger molecules that we use for different purposes within our body. Now, all living organisms are made up of these major basic elements, including carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. There's also some trace elements, phosphorus and sulfur, etc. And using these different elements, we're able to create specific biomolecules, such as sugars, amino acids, fatty acids, and nucleotides. And these are called monomers, or the smallest version of these particular things, but they get comprised into polymers or longer versions of these macromolecules. So small molecules combine to form larger macromolecules, right? So monosaccharides become polysaccharides um, or complex carbohydrates. So simple sugars become complex carbs. Amino acids are going to become proteins. Fatty acids become fats. Nucleotides become nucleic acids. So again, these are monomers. These are polymers, okay? So these are, again, single units, long chains. Um, okay. All living things are comprised of multiple cells, at least one, but many, usually many cells. So all eukaryotic organisms are more than one cell. And cells are going to be separated from other cells or from outside of the cell, this external environment, by a cell membrane. So a cell membrane plays a role in separating the inside from the outside. Again, we have multicellular organisms and single-celled organisms. Some single-celled organisms, these are called prokaryotes. They are going to include bacteria, yeast, and algae. Uh, multicellular organisms include, well, all plants and all animals. Um, so here they give zebra mussels, peach trees, and dogs as examples, but um, we as humans are obviously multicellular as well. And anything that is considered to be alive has specific characteristics that it must um, meet in order to be considered alive. One of the things that life has to have in terms of a characteristic of life is growth and metabolism. That means that we have to use energy for things like motion, for growth, and repair. And the ultimate source of energy for all life on Earth is going to come from the sunshine, which is then going to be able to be utilized by photosynthetic organisms 
to be able to create energy. And when we say energy, in this case we're using, um, we're going to be storing energy in the high energy bonds of the glucose molecule. All right? So glucose is going to be our ultimate storage form of energy, but then we're going to break it down via the process of metabolism. So metabolism is split up into anabolic and catabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways are going to build things up. Think anabolic steroids pump you up, right? And catabolic pathways break things down. Think about cats and how they like to knock things off of tables and break vases, all right? So the combination of both your anabolic, building things up, and your catabolic or breaking things down pathways is going to be metabolism. And the metabolic pathways are basically just taking one macromolecule and breaking it into other macromolecules and transferring energy from one form to another, starting from something called glucose and being broken down and, and creating something called ATP, which is an energy carrier molecule that we use to be able to run all of our metabolic processes. All right, so one of the major things that's a property of living things is growth and metabolism. The next step is going to be reproduction. So another characteristic of life is being able to reproduce. All organisms reproduce. We reproduce both sexually and asexually. Now, not all organisms reproduce sexually, but all organisms that reproduce sexually also reproduce asexually. Think about cutting your finger and having it fix itself or repair itself or heal over a couple of days' time, right? That's asexual reproduction. So our cells in our body are going to be dividing some of them more often than others, some of them quite continuously, um, like your blood cells, for example. I'm sorry, like your bone marrow creating your, your blood cells, for example. Um, other things are going to divide on a much slower level, like your neurons in your um, cerebral spinal section, right, your, in your nervous tissue. But all cells in the body do divide at different rates. And some organisms reproduce much more quickly than others. For example, single-celled organ organisms like bacteria or prokaryotes are going to reproduce on the order of every 20 minutes. Some things reproduce in an order of six white weeks, so mice have a reproductive span from conception to delivery of about six weeks. And some organisms are going to reproduce only a few times in their lifetimes. Um, for example, humans, which have an approximate lifespan of 80 years, generally only have a couple of children. Now, we can have as many as we're able to have in those, you know, 20 or 30 or so reproductive years. Um, and again, that's going to be sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual reproduction, such as healing and growth and repair. Now, organisms are able to reproduce in many different ways, um, including binary fission, such as bacteria, or sexual reproduction, which is the intermixing of DNA, which is what we're going to talk about when we get to reproduction, or, well, human reproduction, all right? Um, all living things are comprised of a hereditary material that's a genetic material known as DNA, and DNA is going to have to be reproduced and then subject to division before the organism itself is able to divide. Um, and DNA is going to have particular information coded in it in sections called alleles. And these um, genes are going to have specific alleles that determine the characteristics of an organism. All right. Another property of living things is, is their ability to evolve over time. And I want to be very clear here when I say evolve. One organism does not evolve. A population of organisms is subjected to selective pressure, which leads to a change in the genetic composition of that population from one generation to the next. Again, it's not an individual that evolves, it's a whole population that sees a shift in allelic frequencies or a new um, arise in particular genetics that are going to change the percentage frequencies of their genetics from one generation to the next. Now, we as humans have 46 chromosomes. That's 23 chromosomal pairs. And we have specific genes that are found at what we call loci or a particular locus, one gene at one locus, within those chromosomes. But we have different copies of genes at those loci. So while we all at a particular location are going to have hair color, some of us are going to have the allele or variation for blonde hair color, and some of us will have the allele for red hair color or black hair color or brown hair color, right? Um, and so the genetic variation known as allelic variation that encode for things like skin pigmentation or body height allow us to have variability within the population and what we call our phenotype or our outward appearance. So we'll have phenotypic variability based on the genotypic variability that occurs based on the change in genetics of the population over many generations. All right, this one is my favorite, homeostasis. So we're going to talk about homeostasis a zillion times over the semester. 
Homeostasis means the maintenance of a stable internal environment. And basically, if there is a parameter that you can think of, we have a too high and a too low. Uh, for example, temperature, we say within certain, all right, too high, we're going to end up burning. Too low, we're going to end up freezing. That's the same thing with our blood pH, with our salinity, our blood sugar levels. No matter what happens on the outside, we have to stay within certain parameters within our body or it starts to break down. And so we maintain homeostasis by multiple different feedback loops, whereby if we go too far low, we start bringing things back up, or if we go far, too far high, we start bringing things back down so that we can maintain each one of these particular um, biological necessities within particular parameters, right? So this is what I'm talking about. Homeostasis is going to involve a lot of negative feedback loops. A negative feedback mechanism basically occurs when receptors are going to detect a change in a particular controlled condition, signal that change to the integrating center, which then sends a signal to some sort of effector, which changes or corrects whatever the change is to alter it back to normal. All right, so here we have some sort of stimulus that disrupts some sort of st controlled condition, all right? So when we have a disruption of the stimulus, right, we have a disruption of the controlled condition, again, no matter what it is that we are trying to detect, we have a particular receptor that detects it. So if we're looking for pressure, we have baroreceptors, right? Um, if we're looking for a concentration of a chemical, we have chemoreceptors. If we're looking for the osmolarity, we have osmoreceptors. So whatever it is that we're trying to maintain within particular parameters, we measure it, and we measure it by receptors. And those receptors go, hey, it's too far out of whack. It's too high. It's too low. Whatever it is that knocks it out of homeostatic conditions. Um, and then those receptors relay that information to an integrating center. This is usually in the brain, but it can be in other parts of the body as well. And that integrating center relays that information to effectors, which change the condition, right? Our blood pressure is too low. Okay, well, when our blood pressure falls too low, the baroreceptors detect that, send information to the integrating center, which then is going to squeeze the vessels via vasoconstriction to help increase our blood pressure. So in response to this negative feedback loop, the response is actually going to cancel or counteract that original stimulus and bring us back into parameters. So again, if it goes too high, we're going to lower it. If it goes too low, we're going to make it higher so that we can get back into our original parameters, which maintains what we call, again, homeostasis. All right, as I just mentioned, if there is something to be measured, we use a receptor to measure it. We use chemoreceptors to measure chemicals, such as neurotransmitters, drug levels, hormone levels. If we're talking about fluid balance, we use osmoreceptors to detect the change in osmolarity, which is refers specifically to the concentration of water relative to the concentration of the ions, things like salts, etc. Um, if we're talking about pressure, we have tactile receptors. We have several different types of tactile receptors. Some receptors detect faint touch, some detect sharp touch, like pain, some that refer, respond to pressure, and others re respond to vibration. And this allows us to have a wide range of tactile sensations, and we can utilize that to interact with our external environment. We also have baroreceptors. Again, anytime we want to detect a pressure, we're going to use a pressure receptor known as a baroreceptor. Uh, one of the things that we detect with this, of course, would be our blood pressure, but we'll also use it to detect things like cerebrospinal pressure, et cetera. So um, anytime that we have a fluid that we need to measure our fluid pressure, we're going to be using baroreceptors to do that. Um, we also have specialty receptors like those found in the retina that are known as photoreceptors. These are going to be rods and cones. They detect light and allow us to have both black and white and color vision. And again, they're very special, found only in the retina. We also have mechanical receptors, known as mechanoreceptors. These are going to detect um, uh, the muscle spindle fibers, detect stretching, and is going to allow us to say, oh, we're overstretching, please stop, so that we don't end up injuring ourselves. Proprioceptors allow us to detect our body position. So proprioception is the idea that when you shut your eyes, you still have an idea of where you are relative to your surroundings and where your body is relative to all the rest of your body. So when you shut your eyes, you can still take your hand and touch your knee, for example, or touch your nose. Because proprioceptors allow you to detect your body's position relative to the rest of your body as well as relative to your external environment. Um, we also have noce receptors that detect pain. We have multiple different types of pain that we can detect, right? So we have sharp pain, like a stabbing pain, like a slice of the scalpel. And then we have a nice dull pain, like a, a ebbing toothache, for example. Um, but either way, noce receptors are going to detect these different types of pain. If we want to detect temperature, we're going to use a thermoreceptor. So the overview of these two slides is basically if there's something that needs to maintain a homeostatic condition, some sort of parameters where it can't go too high and it can't go too low, we use a receptor to detect whatever those parameters are, to make sure that we can stay within our homeostatic parameters. Okay, so we talked about negative feedback loops. 
let's talk about a positive feedback loop. And positive feedback loops are kind of abnormal. We don't see them very often. One of the classic ones that we use, for example, is during labor and delivery. So we want to push the baby all the way out. And so what we will do is um, have a, a stimulus, in this case a contraction. A contractile event is going to cause stretching, so the stretch receptors are going to detect that we have stretching occurring in the cervix and in the uterus, etc. And then that information gets sent to a control center or integrating center in the brain. Um, but instead of trying to disrupt that controlled condition or bring it back to normal, right, we say we had stretch receptors and we would say, hey, stop pushing. Actually, what we're doing is we're worsening it by affecting the actual uterine muscles and telling them to contract more. So that contraction causes more stretching, right? That stimulus is the contraction, causes more stretching, causes more contracting, causes more stretching until we eventually end up with a end result, in this case the expulsion of the fetus. So a positive feedback loop is kind of rare. Um, we also see it when we're getting rid of a splinter, for example, where we're pushing something towards the surface. It becomes more aggravated and more angry, which pushes it towards the surface a little bit more, which makes it more aggravated and more um, angry, which eventually pushes it towards the surface a little bit more, and eventually ruptures, the splinter is released. So a positive feedback mechanism is when we're trying to get to a end goal, the removal of a foreign body, right, like a splinter, or in this case here, the expulsion of a fetus during labor and delivery. Okay, so we're going to end most of our chapters with a, a real-world application. So today's application is going to talk about chocolate cake and how that is going to um, add sugar to the bloodstream. So we have Frida, who has just consumed a large piece of chocolate cake. That's added sugar from her digestive tract into her bloodstream, which the increase in blood sugar is going to cause the pancreas to release insulin. Insulin is going to be responsible for... Um, sugar uptake into the body cells, including into the liver, and also allow that sugar to be converted into fat to be stored for longer terms. So after that individual Frida eats, she's going to have a brief blood sugar rise, and then that's going to decrease back to normal levels. This is because Frida is healthy and is using homeostasis to maintain her blood sugar levels. So here's some thinking questions about this. What is the stimulus in this case? What type of receptor is involved? What is the integrating center? What are the effectors? Is this feedback loop a positive or a negative feedback loop? And what would happen if your body was not able to normally regulate blood sugar? All right, so here's some answers. What was the stimulus in this case? The stimulus, and a lot of you might have said eating the chocolate cake, and that's not the case. The stimulus is actually a rise in the blood sugar, which occurs after the cake has been eaten. The second question referred to the type of receptor, and in this case, the type of receptor is a chemoreceptor that detects the chemical. In this case, the chemical is sugar. And in the body, chemoreceptors are going to be found in the pancreas. Now, oftentimes, the integrating center is going to be the brain. But in this case, as I mentioned, the chemoreceptors are found in the pancreas. So that's where the detection of the blood sugar is going to be found, right, or going to occur. And this is going to also determine that the increase in blood sugar has happened, which will then result in the release of insulin. The effector in this case is still the pancreas because the pancreas is releasing that insulin, which is going to have the effect of decreasing the blood sugar level. Because we're returning back to homeostatic conditions, right? Our blood sugar goes too high, we bring it back down. That's considered a negative feedback loop. The effect by releasing the insulin, therefore reducing the blood sugar, is to cause the blood sugar levels to decrease back to normal levels. And the diagnosis of an individual who is unable to regulate their blood sugar would be diabetes. All right, thank you so much for listening to our first lecture. I will see you guys very shortly when we resume classes. Aloha and have a fabulous day.